The most important feature of amateur radio is to receive signals as clearly as possible. Unfortunately, we're surrounded by all sorts of noise. This video deals with many noise sources that affect amateur bands and describes some strategies for tracking them down. We may not know where the interference is coming from, but one thing is for sure, you will receive very little assistance from electrical suppliers or telecommunications regulators unless you can first provide a lot of information about the problem. Getting a formal investigation underway is expensive for them and from their perspective they don't want to waste resources chasing ghosts. You're going to have to prepare a strong case that says where they should be looking before they'll react on your behalf. That's what this video is for. It's difficult to elaborate on all of these factors in this video, but we'll cover as much as we can. Here we'll be focusing on interference affecting home stations. For more information about dealing with interference, visit the website QRM Guru, where these topics are dealt with comprehensively. So, if you turn on your radio and experience some interference, certainly take some action, but do it the right way. We've broken down this task into two distinct phases, gathering information and tracking down the source. While gathering this information, make some notes. We'll need to look at three distinct patterns in what we experience. A sound pattern, a frequency pattern, and a timing pattern. If we are ever called upon to present formal evidence, then the notes we take here will become very important sound patterns. Listen carefully. If possible, make your own recording of what you are hearing. Is it a non-repetitive buzzing noise? Continuous wideband noise is typical of interference from a domestic appliance or a lighting system. Is it a blend of modulated signals from some commercial transmission? combination of voice, data or other deliberate modulation could mean that you're experiencing a mixing event that places the sum or difference frequency of two stations exactly where you happen to be operating. Is it a systematic crackle or rattle? Signs of crackles and rattles that interrupt the interference at irregular intervals could indicate a form of external mixing and retransmission. Two metallic surfaces rubbing together that have no physical connection to a nearby transmission can still create havoc, particularly on windy days. Next we look for frequency patterns. Is it a fixed frequency? Use a general coverage receiver and try to see if the interference only appears in one place. Very stable interference is a clue that there are probably commercial transmitters involved. Does it slowly wander across a range of frequencies? This can be a sign of parasitic oscillation in a transmitter's output stage as it warms up. Is it a continuous wideband noise? This is a classic sign of switch mode power supply noise from LED lighting and home appliances. Does it appear on multiple spots up and down the band? Some cable TV services produce this effect. Take a note of where the interference is at its strongest and how far up the spectrum the interference reaches. We'll use this information when we begin tracking the signals. Maybe this is difficult to do without access to special equipment, but take it as far as you can. Go back to your rig and work your way up the spectrum and try to find the highest frequency where this interference can be heard. Take notes. Don't be afraid to look at VHF and UHF parts of the spectrum as well. Switch to a different antenna, perhaps a section of wire inside your room. It's good if you can get access to a general coverage handheld with an AM receive mode, as interference tends to be amplitude modulated. Lastly, we look at the importance of timing patterns. Is the interference there all of the time? If it comes and goes, what's the interval? Does the interference reoccur at similar times each day? Does it follow a pattern of daylight and darkness? 
One of the strongest clues in identifying our interference source is to log when the interference comes and goes. Wideband noise that only appears at night could be from a neighbour turning on an outside floodlight, but interference that peaks in the middle of the day could be coming from a solar inverter system that's generating maximum power. Does it get worse in windy conditions? Does it get worse with rainfall? Does it improve after rain has fallen? Is there no discernible pattern? Interference associated with long dry spells and rain are common symptoms of power line noise. Dust on insulators can slowly build up over time and begin to arc out and generate noise. This noise may then stop after a good storm flushes away the dust. Pole transformers may begin to break down internally under heavy loads and hot days, which often occur at the same time. Once we've recorded as many details as possible, we can move on to the second phase where we try to physically locate the source of the interference. Before driving through the streets, waving directional antennas and frightening the neighbours, we're first going to check to see if the interference is coming from our own home. Set up the troubled receiver with a battery power source. Wait for the interference to appear, then progressively shut down all the power in your house. This must include hot water services, kitchen ovens, and if you have one, your solar inverter. Slowly turning the breakers off is better than killing everything first and slowly turning them back on, as the noise source may take some time to reappear and this could give misleading results. If you do hear the interference drop out, then the problem is on your own property. This is a good thing as it's much easier to do something about it when the source is under your control. In this instance, the noise that had been causing havoc on the 40 meter band stopped when we cut the power to the room that held our TV and video equipment. It didn't take long to confirm that the power supply in this poor quality DVD player was at fault. Is the interference coming from an adjacent residence? This is a harder question to answer as most homes are surrounded by plenty of other homes and we don't want to make the mistake of blaming the wrong source. Assuming that we have proven the interference isn't ours, then we have to determine if it's coming from a nearby neighbour, from some public utility, or from a strong interfering signal much further away. There are a few strategies available to us to work this out. No one strategy will work every time, so you have to be prepared to try several. If the interference is not too close, and you have a large rotatable antenna, then you may get a strong bearing in a single direction, and this is useful to know. If interference is coming from an immediate neighbour, it could penetrate under your beam antenna and give a false beam heading. The next step is a simple one. Get a portable receiver and go for a walk. If you can hear the interference on your portable radio, tune to the frequency where it seems to be the strongest. Then walk up and down your street and see if it gets louder, weaker, or remains roughly the same. You don't yet know if the interference is from power lines, a neighbour's appliance, or something else entirely. But if we use our previous investigation of patterns, then we should be able to work this out. The signal that comes and goes at regular times is more likely to be a neighbour than a power pole. But now it's time to do some direction finding. In our previous video we constructed a simple DF loop antenna which can help here. Now we'll show you how to use it. The loop will pick up the interference, but it's a balanced antenna. This means that when we're on edge to the interfering source, it will be at its strongest, but when the loop is broadside to the source, there is a phase cancellation and we hear a definite null in the interfering signal. With this demonstration, we've set up a noisy LED floodlight away from other possible interfering sources and can hear the reduction in noise when the loop faces the light fitting. This antenna can be used to help pinpoint a home that is the source of interference. If you knock on the door and the occupant is friendly enough to let you enter the home, then you can go further and use this tool to pinpoint the source down to a few metres. Don't try to triangulate the noise source, just chase it in the direction of the deepest null. If the signal starts to fade, then you're going the wrong way. Reverse direction and keep chasing the signal. 
If you do determine that the residence is responsible for the noise, but the occupant is not interested in cooperating, then all you can do is log the information you have collected so far and forward it to the regulator. In Australia, that's the ACMA. Their website has a useful form for reporting what you know about the interference. If you're an amateur station that's being interfered with, then that's noteworthy. But if you can show that a commercial radio or TV station is affected as well, then it will add more weight to your complaint. So we've progressed to the point where the interference is not in our own home and not in our neighbour's home. Is it coming from public infrastructure, power, cable TV, paging services? How far from your home can the interference be heard? There's a fair chance the noise is coming from some local power infrastructure. There could be a transformer or cross arm bracket or insulator stack that's generating HF, VHF noise and the power lines themselves are spreading the signal, possibly for several kilometres. It may seem like the signal is coming from everywhere and even the DF loop doesn't seem to be working properly. There is another strategy to use to get closer to the source. This technique appeared in the Interference Handbook, first published in the 1980s. In the last video we demonstrated the effect when noise sources rise higher up the spectrum as we get closer to them. We can use this technique to localise which pole is producing the noise. Back to the handheld receiver with the whip antenna, be prepared for some walking. Trying to find the strongest interference signal is not easy with power lines as the interference can be all around you. Instead, tune up the band until the interference begins to fade out. This could even extend into VHF. When you find this edge, start walking along the power lines. If it fades out completely, then you're going the wrong way. Reverse direction and keep walking. From time to time, increase the receive frequency as the interference stretches higher up the band. If it starts to fade again, then you've gone too far. Probably you've already gone past the offending pole. We don't want to get closer to any power infrastructure beyond what can be observed safely from the ground, but it will help significantly if we can find out which pole is responsible for the noise. Even if you can only narrow it down to a couple of poles, then that may have to do. Each pole has a unique identity plate. Record those details and the distance from the nearest intersecting street. This is what you must send to the power company. In newer neighbourhoods, there is a lot of underground power infrastructure. This tends to be of high quality, but check out some of the transformers at street level as possible sources of noise. They also have clear identification markings. If you want to prove the exact location, there are two more techniques, but these will require special equipment. First is acoustic, as when arcing takes place on a power pole, it generates sounds well above human hearing. A directional microphone with an ultrasonic converter can pinpoint the precise locations on a pole where noise is being generated. Electrical arcing generates a deep growl that is quite different to the surrounding sounds. This equipment is similar to that used for tracking movement of bats. The next strategy is to use infrared imaging to look for hot spots on a power pole, particularly on a cool morning when the contrast is higher. If you have access to one, you can rapidly spot abnormalities invisible to the human eye. Here's a demonstration where a high voltage arc has been set up between two large galvanised bolts. Visually there's not much to see, particularly in daylight, but under infrared one of the bolts will be building up an abnormal amount of heat and this can be seen on power infrastructure as a hotspot from some distance away. Either way, the evidence you gather here can be the difference between gaining the support of your power company or being ignored by them. Tracking down interference from power lines and commercial services is never easy. There is a tendency for the people who own this infrastructure to ignore you or simply shift the blame elsewhere. Sometimes the response is to shoot the messenger and blame amateurs for having overly sensitive receivers. But that's a false argument and operators shouldn't have to put up with that kind of response. Complaints processes. Where the interference comes from a specific business or residence, the ACMA may become involved if you've been unable to resolve the issue directly. To do that, you must complete the interference complaint form at the ACMA website. The website path is complex. The best way to reach that site is to make an internet search for ACMA interference complaint form. And that should take you straight to it. If the source of the noise is coming from a utility service provider, such as a power company, 
the ACMA may decline involvement and require the complainant to lodge a complaint with the power company directly. For example, Energy Australia subcontract their maintenance work to Osnet services. Their path for lodging a complaint is shown here. In recent years, some power companies have taken the position that they will only investigate an interference complaint if it has come from the ACMA and will not assist individual customers. This is a circular reference that does not deal with the problem. If the power company is uncooperative, the way forward is to register an additional complaint with the Ombudsman's Office, Australian Energy Regulator. They can direct the power company to do their job and resolve your interference complaint. So what you should be taking away from this video is the need for carefully recording details about the nature of the interference that you've experienced. You should be more familiar with some of the strategies available to us for tracking down this type of interference. The more you can reduce the noise floor at your station location, the better your on-air experience will be. You don't necessarily have to accept a high noise level as being something totally beyond your control. Reducing interference is not an easy task, but it's always worthwhile. This brings us to the end of this video. If it's been useful to you, then certainly leave comments and tell us about your radio interference story. Look for our upcoming videos which deal with automotive interference and what to do when your transmissions have an effect upon others in your community. If you want to see how we dealt with interference from the defective DVD player so it never happens again, keep watching to see the deleted scene.